He just said, my way is the only way. We do that. We could do that as an individual, but we get into a lot of trouble culturally when we have people who are in positions of power, right? So physicians who have a diet framework, right? And they become the advocate of that thing. People who are in position of being able to influence healthcare and our healthcare system and policy and things like that, being bought into a certain narrative about nutrition. That's how we get into a situation where it's advocated for people to eat low fat. That's how it happens, right? The way that I believe is right is should be done for everybody, mm-hmm. right? And so let's be a little bit more cautious about that, you know, when we are, for us, because it, it, the end of one matters. And I did this as well. When I was doing clinical work, if I was into something, guess what? Everybody <laughs> coming into the office, you're gonna be doing what I'm into. Raw vegan, paleo, whatever it is, right? But eventually, and I'm so grateful for this, I got to a place where I really understood I have to do what's right for this person in front of me. And it takes, it's hard. It's hard to do that because you can't just reach into your bag of standard of care. Even if you're doing things which you perceive to be a higher level of this thing, it's still, I cannot treat everybody the same way. I've got to investigate. And that's what I saw was, and the same thing with you in the work that you're doing now is like, let me get out of this system that has people coming in on this revolving door, you know, seven minutes with me, 10 minutes with me, and be able to actually get to the heart of what's going on in this person's life. Because even if, and I'll hear this, and I I wanna ask you about this. One of the things that kind of came out, even for the last couple of years of chaos, when talking about we need to get our citizens metabolically healthier, it's the most powerful health insurance that we have by far. Obesity is the number one risk factor for death from this particular virus. Let's focus on getting folks healthier. Well, here comes some of my colleagues. You know, you're right, Sean, but people just won't listen. They won't listen. That's why I give them the drug. People won't listen. When I tell them to eat better and exercise, they won't listen. Can you speak to that? And what I feel to be is an excuse as to not focusing on what can really get people well. Yeah, I mean, it's easier to prescribe a medication than it is to actually say, I want you to go to bed 30 minutes earlier every night. In addition to that, I want you to walk a mile every day. Really taking the time to explain, because saying to someone, exercise more and change your diet, people are like at a loss for what does that represent? We're not really educating our patients or giving them resources that are making it easy enough for them. The other thing is meeting them where they are. Maybe that patient wants to make those changes, but they, they are, there's so much thrown at them yeah. that they can't absorb it. So the one thing I've learned is keep it simple. Like the message should be very simple and very concrete. You know, when I work with clients now, it's very specific nutrition. I want you to do X three times a week. I want you to do Y five times a week. Very, very specific. So. We have been conditioned as clinicians to write prescriptions to address symptoms. That is the way we are taught in traditional allopathic medicine. And so we aren't taught to talk about nutrition. We're not taught to talk about lifestyle modifications or lifestyle medicine. So is it any wonder that we're ill-equipped to have those conversations? And, you know, that person's thinking, I've got 15 other people that are going to be coming in and I've got to somehow make time for all this so talking about lifestyle medicine is going to take 20 minutes of my time. I don't have 20 minutes, so I'm just going to write the script. And I'll tell them to come back in two months, and then we'll have that conversation. So it's those missed opportunities, and it's also understanding the system is so broken. You know, unfortunately, and I and I say physicians because physicians for a long time were really the leaders, the only people, the only really prescribing providers for a long period of time, they want to take care of patients. They don't want to run a medical practice. They don't want to fight with insurance companies. The insurance companies have largely taken over and they're dictating the kind of care we're able to deliver to patients. So it's really a multi-tiered problem that is impacting these provider patient relationships. I don't think it's that people don't want to change. I don't think they know how to change and we have to do a better job. That's why I think having health coaches and nutritionists in the office that could be filling in the gaps yeah. so that you know the, the healthcare provider could focus on the most specific things they need to focus on. The health coaches who do such amazing jobs with coaching and educating patients could do, we could just prescribe, okay, this is what we need to do with patient X. 
go and run with it, have them come in once a week for six weeks, we would have much better patient outcomes. Patients would be better informed. They would be less confused. Providers would be happier because they got to focus on what they wanted to focus on. on. The health coaches, nutritionists, nutrition team would be happy because they're focusing on what they love to do. And patients ultimately would do better. But the current system is so broken. That's why we're seeing functional and integrative medicine really taking hold right now is that people are desperate for other options and alternatives. This is so wonderful because you're also talking about solutions here, right? So we have people in position where they can do what they're really equipped to do, which is to prescribe medication in those proper instances, surgeries and the like, and folks who can actually take the time. And because at the end of the day, it's not a matter of, because personally as well, I've never met one person who didn't want to be healthy. Exactly. It's just that gap between where they are and where they want to be, sometimes you can get into a state of learned helplessness where you don't know, you don't believe it's even possible for you, or you and or you don't know how to get there. And this is where the real skill set comes in. And getting back to really the origin of the word doctor in our culture has kind of been lost in a sense, which is teacher, right? Being able to really teach you about health and your body and how to care for this thing. And it's not that the patient won't listen. It's being able to find out what's going on in their psychology so that they do listen or and or is the data that you're giving them on that particular thing, is it even valid, right? Are you setting them up for failure, telling them to do some shit that's not going to work in the first place, which that happened for me. You need to cut your fat, right? Low fat diet, cut your calories, whatever, and seeing people struggle trying to do those things. And so this just speaks to really one of the most important things that's missing that can be supplanted with having health coaches in the office would be to actually spend time because this is where everything changed where I start to see people coming in with you know abnormal blood sugar they got a bad bag of medication they've been struggling with trying to lose 20 50 pounds for years whatever all this stuff just started coming off everything started resolving when I actually started to find out what's going on in this person's life that's a leading that's creating the symptoms right because being a nutritionist i just focused on food and food is just one thing food it can be uh it can be a medicate a self medication for some folks it can be the thing that they're kind of stumbling it could be a booby trap for them but it's just one piece it it is likely even if the self medication the struggle with their work yeah. right or their relationship or their kids, or like really taking time to see another person. So often that's what's missing from their life, just being seen, just having the opportunity for somebody to listen to you. That's what coaching is. Coaching isn't you telling the person your thing, it's being able to listen, ask questions, because that person knows the cause and the solution for their struggles, oftentimes if you just create a space for them. 10 or seven minutes on average, but 10 to 15 minute office visit and you're in pain, oftentimes isn't gonna get to the heart of the matter. And so we can marry these things together. And by the way, my favorite health coaching institute, Transformational Nutrition, go to transformationalnutrition.com forward slash model. And the accreditation is there to be able to work in a doctor's office and to facilitate and provide their service. I know this is where things are going because the industry has just exploded in the last five to eight years and it's only getting bigger and things have got straight crazy as you know the last couple of years and so i think that the need is going to go even higher but with that said you got to put yourself in position to be of service in this new context so all of that to say you know when we're coming into the situation and we have these tools at our disposal you understanding more about nutrition and helping people to implement and with their lifestyle how important is it for people to experiment themselves because i would imagine even if you're giving them this thing to do like you know to follow your incredible plan everything might not go according to plan so how can people tune into themselves to start to be able to refine things for themselves well, I, I applaud you for, for bringing all of that up because I think on a lot of levels, the current system has needs that are not being met. And I really do fervently believe that health coaches 
and nutrition professionals are two badly needed resources in the current paradigm to be able to meet the needs of our patients. Because you're very right, it's can you take a really good history? And I used to, you know, feel as an NP, my docs would say, how did you get that? How, how where did you get that? I said, because I listened. Mm. And so we're so focused on what's our agenda with a patient as opposed to listening. So half the battle is listening. But with that being said, I think that on a lot of levels, when we're looking at helping people make change, it's getting very clear about what's reasonable and feasible for them. Um, it's important to say, like, I trained in the inner city, and so we would have patients that got labeled as non-compliant. Mm. And, they got, and then automatically that followed them everywhere they went. So everyone was already walking into the room saying, this patient's non-compliant. Well, maybe it wasn't that they weren't compliant. Maybe they didn't understand. Yeah. Maybe they didn't have the resources. If you're talking to someone who's in a, in a situation where they can't afford to buy groceries and you're saying they're supposed to have pasture raised you know uh pasture wild caught uh you know meat and eggs and i mean that's going to blow their mind they're going to tune you out automatically so it has to be meeting people where they are yeah. and assessing that readiness for change i think those are two important really important variables that are very often not discussed if we really want to make an impact in our patients lives we have to get down to find it like what it, what is feasible for them not making it our agenda that's the other thing that i see a lot of clinicians doing they want patients to do what they're telling them to do instead of finding out what's reasonable and feasible for that patient to do yeah so i love that directing people towards also within themselves their own what's feasible for you trust what can you do right now towards that goal instead of again but i think it could be a lot and so can you talk a little bit about how you've outlined things for everybody in your book and yeah i think that's just the plan itself is super helpful yeah no so it really starts off with setting people up for success like there's a whole prep period so that you'll clean out your pantry and, and ensure that you're getting the resources you need in your home to be successful. And it's a 45 day program. So it really does walk you through every day of the program with action points and things to focus in on. There's a lot of resources in the book. And then there are challenges. So maybe someone's not new to fasting and they're ready to do some challenges, longer fasts, protein sparing, modified fasts, all different variations of fasting. But it's also honoring the N of one. It's really honoring you as a bio individual. What are you ready for? Like newbies can do this book and just do it slowly and methodically. People who are looking to take their fasting to another level can definitely get insights out of the book that would be super helpful. So it was really designed to be able to meet a variety of needs, just like when I teach this class organically, uh, which I do a couple times a year. I always say this is really for everyone, that we can meet the needs of everyone by assessing like, who are the newbies? Who are the people who have been doing this a while and things are not working? And then we can kind of tease out all the calamities in between. Awesome. It's available right now everywhere books are sold, Intermittent Fasting Transformation. Can you let everybody know where they can follow you, get more information, and if there's a best place for them to pick up the book? Yeah, thank you. Well, I always say, you know, the the brick and mortar businesses have really taken a hit over the past two years. So if you're able to buy this from a brick and mortar place, but yes, you can get on Amazon, Target, Barnes and Noble. Um, easiest place to connect with me is my website. So it's my name, www.cynthiathurlow.com. I have a podcast that you'll be a guest on this fall. I'm super excited about that, Everyday Wellness. And then I co-host the Intermittent Fasting Podcast with Melanie Avalon. Um, and then I'm on Instagram at Cynthia underscore Thurlow underscore Admittedly, I'm a little snarky on Twitter. I have to forewarn everyone. And we also have a free <laughs> Facebook group called um, Intermittent Fasting and Transformation backslash my name. And everyone's welcome in that group. It's just a super supportive, nice group of men and women that are in there. So awesome. Listen, I love what you're doing. I love what you stand for. Your story is incredible. And, you know, this is such a great opportunity right now to equip people with real tools of transformation you know you, you're the title of your book intermittent fasting transformation and being able to take control of their own health and to be empowered and to utilize our healthcare professionals as coaches as guidance as support but starting to be your own advocate first and foremost you know so we can come into the situation more educated and also what i learned from this conversation personally is the importance of being healthy coming into life's inevitable challenges because something's going to happen life be life and so everybody needs to stay ready so that you don't have to get ready and i appreciate you so much for coming to hang out with me fun fact 
it's your anniversary today. It is. It is. 19 years. It's hard to believe. It's like I, if you marry the right person, it's worth it. You know, that effort every day you make. Yeah. One of the secrets that you share with me is just liking each other. Yes. You know, I think people lose sight of that, you know, when they have children and they get so enmeshed in the day to day stuff with their kids. And I'm starting to see glimpses of what life will be like as an empty nester. And my husband and I laugh as we're walking our two dogs every morning. We're like, we're definitely at that stage of life where we're like, we have become those people. We know everyone's dogs. We say <laughs> hello to everyone. We're like, you know, the the horizon of, of being, you know, kids in college is upon us. So it's definitely a big shift. But yeah, liking him is a huge part of it.